Good morning. morning. Welcome to God's House on this National Day of Thanksgiving. If you want to know the history of Thanksgiving, I I gave you just a little bit of of President Abraham Lincoln's proclamation of a National Day of Thanksgiving in the very front of your bulletin. As, As Christians, we take this excuse and gather together to thank the God from whom all blessings flow, and that's exactly what we'll do this morning in a special order of service. Our first lesson on this day of thanksgiving is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, beginning at verse 10. Here Moses gives the children of Israel a warning for when they get into the promised land. Then you will eat, and you will be filled, and you will praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be very careful so that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and ordinances and his statutes that I am commanding you today. When you eat and are satisfied and you build nice houses and move into them and your herds and your flocks multiply and your, and your silver and gold increase and everything that you have prospers, watch out so that your heart does not become arrogant and forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you were slaves. Do not forget the Lord who led you in the great and terrifying wilderness where there were venomous snakes and scorpions where the thirsty ground had no water, but the Lord made water come out out of a flint rock for you. Do not forget the Lord, who in the wilderness fed you manna, which your fathers had not known before, to humble you and to test you, so that it would be good for you later on. You might say in your heart, My ability and the power of my hand have earned this wealth for me. But then you are to remember that the Lord your God is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth to confirm his covenant that he promised to your fathers with an oath, as he does to this day. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson is taken from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, beginning at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel is recorded in the book of Luke, chapter 17, beginning at verse 11, which will serve as our sermon text for this morning. On another occasion, as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. When he entered a certain village, ten lepers met him. Standing at a distance, they they called out loudly, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. As they went away, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, thanking him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus responded, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God, our Heavenly Father, who opens his hands and gives us all blessings, even especially, most importantly, the Son that he gave us to wash our sins away. Our text for this morning, again, is taken from that first or that last lesson, the gospel lesson, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19, where we have that familiar account of Jesus healing the ten lepers, one of whom was a thankful Samaritan. Dear brothers and dear sisters in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, what makes a person thankful? Are are you a thankful person? 
just by your typical attitude? Are you one that looks at things with a thankful gratitude in your heart? Psychologists will, will tell us that when people have a, a lack of, of gratitude in their attitude, there, there's one way that you can encourage them and to be a little bit more thankful in their lives. And that is to take a look at the good things that you have in your life. So, so what they tell you is actually what we used to do in our newsletters up until a couple of years ago. I used to write down from A to Z and put one line for each of the letters of the alphabet. And then I encourage people to say, okay, give me one blessing that starts with an A and a B and a C and all the way through Z. And, and psychologists will tell us that when you, when you see something in your life that is a good thing that starts with an A and, and, and all the way through Z, that will encourage people to have a more grateful, thankful attitude in their lives. And, and it's good for a person too because when you have a thankful attitude, studies will show that people are happier. They're easier to be around. They wake up more refreshed because they have better night's sleeps, better night's sleep. They are kinder, they are more gentle. Everything about them is better when a person has a grateful, thankful attitude. And so in other words, when we look hard enough and we find some good things in our life for which to be grateful, that will help our life become better all the way around. But what happens and what about the guy who a couple of days ago was trying to be a good Samaritan got out of his car <clears throat> to help a car in front of him that had had an accident on a bridge. And a couple of seconds later, his car was rear-ended from the side and he was forced over the side of the bridge only to hang on to the side of the bridge for a couple of minutes before plunging into the icy cold waters of the Snake River below. After which, he thought the only way that he was going to survive and live, because it was dark out and EMT had not come yet, was to swim to an island where he stayed until the EMTs came and heard his frantic calls for help from that little island in the river. Is he going to be thankful for what at that particular time in his life? Or, or how about the mom <clears throat> who struggled through her early mom years or could be mom years because she wanted to have a child so badly. God never blessed her with a child. <clears throat> then, in her middle-aged years, she was struck with a brain tumor. At which point, the husband says, you know, I don't think I can deal with your cancer. So he divorces her. And on top of all that, then she loses her job with the insurance that was supposed to pay for the cancer treatments. What good thing in her life is she going to be thankful for? What, what is she supposed to be happy about in her life? Or, or what about the four kids this summer, ages 4 through 16 in Minnesota, who, whose mom and dad went off for a Harley ride and they never came home because they got in a tragic head-on collision, died immediately. Are those four children, what, what are they going to be grateful for? What, what, what are the good things in life that they're going to focus their attention on so that they can have a more grateful attitude, thankful attitude in their lives. Can, can you say to those people, there's got to be something in your life that you can be grateful for. Isn't there something that you can find that you can be happy and thankful for? Isn't there? Probably not, because at that point they're focusing on all of the bad circumstances that have been surrounding them. Instead of telling people that there's always something good to be thankful for in our estimation of good, Jesus doesn't tell us that. Jesus tells us that you can always be thankful for everything in this life, including your troubles, including your hardships, including your, 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 your pains in the world. Jesus tells us that that is the way to be truly grateful. If you change your perspective to understand that, okay, I can thank God by trusting in his promises when I've got some bad problems as well as when I've got some good things going on in my life. And that's what we're going to focus our attention on this morning. That thanking Jesus means trusting in him. When you're ill as well as when you are well. 
the Gospel of Luke <clears throat> is is all throughout the Gospel of Luke. You, you see this this attitude of joy and happiness going through the whole Gospel of Luke. It starts with the announcements of John the Baptist and Jesus to their mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, respectively. When they found out that they were going to have children, that they were going to be mothers, they rejoiced and they were happy. When Mary went to visit Elizabeth, her relative, out in the hill country of Judea, do you remember what happened when Mary told Elizabeth that she was going to have a baby? Even the unborn John the Baptist, in her mother's womb, in Elizabeth's womb, he leapt for joy because he heard the good news of a Savior being born. After Jesus was born, <clears throat> how, were those decept- how were those shepherds feeling when they returned back to their fields outside of Bethlehem? With great joy, praising God, that's how they returned. When, when eight-day-old Jesus was, was circumcised in the temple <clears throat> in Jerusalem, and, and, and these old people, these servants in the temple, Simeon and Anna, they had a chance to hold this baby Jesus in their arms. And, and, and what did they do? They thanked God and they praised God because they could see their salvation. God had allowed them to live that long to see that salvation. When people whom Jesus healed throughout the Gospel of Luke realized that they were healed, what did they do? Their overwhelming attitude was one of gratitude and thankfulness and joy. Even when Jesus ascended into heaven and was gone physically, what does the Gospel of Luke tell us they did? They returned to Jerusalem, those disciples, with great joy, and they stood and stayed continually at the temple praising God. What was the common denominator in all of these people? They were people of faith. They trusted Jesus' promises. It was their God-given faith. In Luke chapter 17, we see the very same thing with these lepers. Ten lepers who had this terrible skin disease called leprosy. <clears throat> we see that from, from their case, true gratitude comes from a, a thankful heart and a believing heart. Understanding that Jesus means what he says. Trusting that Jesus' promises are as good as anybody. Jesus tells us, go, your faith has healed you. That's exactly what that leper understood. Now, now let's go back to that, that miracle. There, there are three words at the beginning of this account that kind of tell us everything that we need to know about this terrible skin disease called leprosy. What are we told at the beginning? When Jesus came to their area and they came out from where they were <clears throat> how did they stay and, and where were they in relation to Jesus they called to him at a distance and that tells you everything that you need to know about leprosy because that's what leprosy did it made you stay at a distance from everybody in your life there were no Thanksgiving gather- gatherings with family and friends for people with leprosy There were no birthday celebrations with people with leprosy. You couldn't even go to work for people with leprosy. You couldn't do anything that you were accustomed to doing before leprosy when you had contracted this terrible skin disease of leprosy. Combined with the hopelessness of the disease because it was hardly ever that somebody was ever cured of this disease, it was tough for a leper to be thankful for anything in their lives. Now, now you and I are not lepers. We don't have those skin disease, that terrible skin disease like they did back in the, in the New Testament. But, but we've got our share of problems, don't we? I don't know that we wake up in the morning and, and don't focus on some challenge that we've got facing us in our lives. There, there's loneliness. There's hopelessness we feel in our lives. There's loss. There's pain. There's some kind of aggravation in our life always present with us. And and, and what do those things make us? It makes us difficult, or it makes it very difficult to thank God who gives us our blessings. And and sometimes we, we believe because of all those problems that God is where? Nowhere near me. He he must be off at a distance. He must be doing something other than what he should be doing, and that is helping me close in my life. He's so far away from me, he probably doesn't even know my problems. Does he even realize what I'm going through in my life? Which leads us to distrust instead of trust. 
which leads us to say, I'm not going to pray to God because I tried that a couple times. It did not work, which leads to anything but thankfulness and a thankful attitude in our lives. We're not going to be thanking God who doesn't help us in our problems, right? But, but this account, first of all, reminds us that God is anything but at a distance in our lives. Luke tells us that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's walking the border between Samaria and Galilee, and he comes close to this city. And even though Luke tells us that the lepers met Jesus on the road, we know very well what really happens. When Jesus comes into contact with anybody in the Gospels, it's Jesus doing this is no coincidence that he just happened upon 10 lepers who needed his help. Jesus made his schedule that day so that he would come into contact with those people. Jesus planned his itinerary to be near them. He may have felt far off for those lepers, but Jesus was truly near, as he is with us. You might feel as if Jesus is far away that he is maybe at a distance from us in everything in our lives. Sometimes Jesus shapes our whole lives, however, in order to keep us to be too far from him. Jesus allows bad stuff in our lives. Jesus allows the loss and the pain and the aggravation and the hopeless feelings in our life so that we Call on him for help, just like those lepers did in our text. Jesus, Master, have, mid, have pity on us, have mercy on us. Jesus allows us to have guilt feelings. Jesus allows us to make bad decisions in our lives. Jesus allows us to get hurt. All meant to help us see what we would have never seen if everything was going just perfectly. That we've got a Savior who is near to us. We've got a Savior who cares about us and proved it on Good Friday. We've got a, a Savior who forgives us and helps us in ways that we could never ever do for ourselves. And so when hardships rule the day in your life, when hardships become the rule rather than the exception in our life, we don't need to look for something good in order to be thankful Christians, people of God. Thank God for the hardships. On, on that list, if you ever make one of those mental lists, A to Z, what can I be thankful for this? Thank God for the colds. And thank God for the loss. And thank God for the hopeless feelings that you have in your life. Because those things allow you to exercise your faith. It reminds you that God is not far away, that God is near, that God keeps his promises. That you who need help and hope in your life, that Jesus is that help and hope. Thanking Jesus simply means trusting in his promises. you got all kinds of them. He doesn't fall short of those promises. Jesus keeps those promises even when you are ill or have bad problems. So, so the next time that you have a hardship, try thanking God for that hardship because you know that you don't even know how it's going to happen, but it's going to happen that it will work out for your good, which is exactly what Jesus did for those lepers that day. Jesus had one simple command for them when they called out, Jesus, have, Jesus Master, have pity on us. He said, go show yourselves to the priests. What was Jesus doing with that one simple command? Act on your faith. Exercise your faith. Believe my simple command. Go show yourself to, pre to the priest. Because the only time that a leper would show himself to the priest would be when he thought that he was cured of his disease. And so that's exactly what they did. And when leper number 10, who happened to be a Samaritan, he realized that he was clean, no skin disease on his extremities anymore, Instead of go showing himself to the priest, he decided to turn around and give thanks to the one who had healed him from that disease. Jesus responds with one simple sentence, go, your faith has made you well. Thanking and trusting Jesus when we are ill is a challenge. <clears throat> thanking and trusting Jesus when we are well is also a challenge. Sometimes as, 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 as challenging as when we are suffering hardships. When, when you leave church this morning, where, where are you heading? Are you, are you going back to the homeless shelter this morning? 
Are, are you going back to a place where you might have a room? You might have a meal waiting for you? You might have heat or you might not have heat? Where, where are you heading back to this morning? I doubt that any of those things are the case. I don't know all of your situations intimately, but I'm guessing that most of you are going back to the comforts of your heated home and probably to a a good, satisfying meal. And then you might sit down in front of a TV, and it's probably not going to be a 13-inch TV either. It's probably going to be a 13 times whatever inch TV. Some of you today are getting paid to eat and paid to sleep and paid to watch TV. Not not all of you get paid vacation days, but I'm guessing that some of you might have that in your job. Why is it so difficult to say thanks and trust in our Savior when things are going well for us as they are going well for us overall? Moses reminds us of the temptation way back in the Old Testament, the first lesson. This is what he said in Deuteronomy. When you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and your flocks multiply and grow large and your silver and gold increase and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud and you will, f- and you will forget the Lord your God. Did that ever come true? We know very well that Moses' prediction came true. In Hosea, the prophet Hosea tells us that Moses' prediction came true when this is what God says about his people. When I fed them, they were satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. And when they became proud, they forgot about me. That's what happens sometimes when everything is going well. We forget about God because everything that we have is from my hard work and my ability. And this is what I have slaved in order to get for myself. It's very easy to forget about the God who gave you the ability, who gave you the mind, who gave you everything that you have to get those things for yourselves. So how do we fight the temptation to be proud of what we have gotten ourselves? How do we remember the God who gives us all things? A form of a cross. You've probably got jewelry. You've probably got something in your house. In church, you've got all kinds of reminders. The cross of Jesus gives us a good reminder every time that we see it. See your Savior on that cross and see the love that he showed you on that cross. And then see everything in life as it really is. God gives you everything, good and bad. Not so good, really bad. He gives all those things to you as blessings. Whether you're ill, whether you are well, if you are a little bit of both in your life, realize that they are all reasons to give thanks to the God and then say thanks with your mouths and also with your lives. Amen.